Tashi Dele. My name is Kimpo Drimadawa, Dr. Dean Pilstek. I am president and one of the teachers at the AWAM Tibetan Buddhist Institute. And today we are on our seventh in a series of talks on the divine feminine women in Tibetan Buddhism. And today our talk is about uh, Machik Labdrin. Uh, Machik Labdrin lived from 1055 until about 1153. We're not sure the exact dates. Um, this was during the heart of the second dissemination of Buddhism into Tibet, which started around the year 900, give or take a little bit. And she is considered only to be second to Yeshe Tsogyal, we talked about previously, uh, of whom she is considered to be a reincarnation. And this was predicted by Pabba Sambhava himself. She is said to be the only person to have founded a Buddhist tradition that went from Tibet to India, uh, which is somewhat controversial. And she's popularly considered to be both a Dakini and a deity. She was a contemporary of Milarepa as well, uh, who was born when he was, she was born when he was age 15, so they lived at approximately the same time. In terms of her life stories, as well as some um, legend, of course details and order and so forth vary, uh, she was considered to be a manifestation of Prajnaparamita, uh, Yam Chimpo, the great mother, uh, perfection of wisdom, and the representing the Buddha's teachings on emptiness. The Heart Sutra is the most popular of the Prajnaparamita texts. She emanated then as a great Mahasiddha, Drundru Zangpo in India, and then wound up transferring his consciousness, he a uh, male, and transferred his consciousness into the heart of Machik's mother in order to benefit beings in Tibet. There were many special signs of her during her pregnancy and her birth, uh, dreams of bikinis, rainbows, having a third eye, being born where she could uh, speak at birth. Uh, in her youth, she had a great ability to read and would read texts for families for pay. And she was a very fast reader and very much in demand. At age 13, her mother died and she became a disciple of Lama Drapa Nongshe and for a period of four years and studied the sutras and tantras. And then um, Mahasiddha Dampa Sangye visited from India. Uh, I'm not sure how many times, some say maybe as many as five times. And then uh, he was born in a Brahmin family in southern India and at age 13 was sent to uh, Vikramalshila University, one of the three great northern universities in, uh, along with Nalanda and Bodh Gaya, and completed his studies and wandered as a yogin and studied at the feet of many great masters of his day in India. Was known for supernatural perception, swift footedness, and realization of Mahamudra, as well as a source of doctrine of pacification of suffering, a practice associated with Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, and also uh, his experience with Mahamudra. He traveled to Tibet in a valley near Mount Everest and taught the Dharma there. Machig is said to have encountered him uh, either a few or several times and may have received some empowerments from him. According to tradition, Dampa became her guru uh, in some of the more mythical accounts, but evidence suggests that, in fact, uh, one of his students, Soman Lama, uh, was her actual guru. She herself insisted that Soman Lama uh, was her root guru. <clears throat> she met Soman Lama, who was a student of Dampa, and received empowerments including Prajnaparamita and this practice, uh, the purification, pacification, excuse me, of suffering text. And then received a series of visits from Dakinis who counseled her to unite with Indian Pandita uh, Topa Bandra. 
and or possibly Dampa Sangye. There's some differences in the story. One story says that uh, Sonam Lama and Lama Drapa foretold that she must unite with Topa uh, Bhadra. And then they met and she received empowerments and teachings, especially the Prajnaparamita, Praj perfection of wisdom, and practiced with him. Some say that she broke her nun vows or that or she says that uh, he actually seduced her. Uh, she told her gurus and who said that she needed to go back and start a family lineage with him that would benefit many sentient beings. And they had two sons and a daughter, which created somewhat of a scandal. And it appears that they had to flee from the central part of Tibet. Later, she renounced worldly life and practiced in isolated places. Again, she met with Dampa Sangye, Dampa Sangye, who told her to go practice to the mountain at Zangri Kengmar. And at age 41, she went into retreat in a cave. A Tara appeared to her along with a host of Dakinis and gave empowerments and blessings. Uh, Machig thanked Tara but humbly requested whether ordinary women could benefit beings. And so Tara responded to her and I'd like to just read her response to you. Yogini, although your innermost heart there in your in innermost heart there is a clear knowledge about the past. Listen carefully and I'll explain it to you. The one known as the primordial mother Yom Chenpo is the ultimate nature of all phenomena, emptiness, the essence of reality, Dharmata. Free from the two veils, she is a pure expanse of emptiness, the knowledge of non-self. She is the matrix which gives birth to all the Buddhas of the three times. However, so as to enable all sentient beings to accumulate merit, the Great Mother appears as an object of veneration through my aspirations and prayers for the sake of all beings. So with that response, Macha Gladwin was convinced that in fact the female form could in fact benefit all beings. So she meditated and taught many beings, humans, non-humans, spirits, and nagas, composed her own tradition, offering the body as food to the demons that we call chud. <coughs> Excuse me. This flourished all over Tibet, spread to India, and they sent two or three Mahasiddhas or Acharyas from Bodhgaya to verify her as a, a valid emanation of Prajnaparamita in human form as well as her Chud tradition. And she responded to them in Indian tongue. They asked how she had learned this and she said she did not need to. She knew it from a previous incarnation in India and had never forgotten it. And they debated for many days and she defeated the Acharyas. Her lineage was propagated by her second son and became very popular in Tibet, Nepal, and India. But as a yogi and yogini practice as opposed to the monastics. Apparently religious authorities in Tibet <clears throat> were not ready for a woman Vajrayana teacher, let alone one who was outside the hierarchy and had founded her own, uh, single-handedly, her own new system. The third Karmapa, however, was credited for collecting and systematizing the literary and practice texts and lineages and then it became more of an inner and meditative practice adopted into the monastic tradition. For the first time any tradition that went from Tibet to India. Uh, currently, the current reincarnation of Machik Labdrum is considered to be Tsultra Malion, who is at the uh, Taramandala Retreat Center in Colorado and uh, is an emanation of Machik Labdrum. So let's look at the Chud practice itself. Uh, it stands for cutting through attachment to ego 
and it's to this body, its form, material things, and so forth. It's all included in that. Through the transformation of the aggregates of body mandala into food offering for the gods, in forms of attachments, and demons, in terms of our afflictions, afflictive emotions, aversions, mental obscurations, and so forth, as an act of compassionate self-sacrifice. So we realize the true nature of mind, pure awareness from this, and it is also then done as a healing practice. You may see that advertised from time to time. The origin is a combination of Indian sources on Prajnaparamita with symbolic shamanistic practices working with spirits to accomplish various goals. And Matruk received this from Dampasange or through him to Sonam Lama, uh, her, um, to her, along with a system known as the pacification of suffering. Matruk uh, integrated these with Vajrayana instructions into this offering of the body as food for demons, which became known as Mahamudra Chet. There are multiple interpretations and lineages, in Sutra, Tantra, and Terma, addressed to different disciples. So there is a special appeal to women, and women often do this practice, and have been spiritual leaders in the Chud tradition. The example of the practice was set by Machik and also Dampa Sangye of the yogi yogini lifestyle. Uh, often considered somewhat outrageous, uh, but certainly a lay lifestyle or householder lifestyle over a monastic community. And it's practiced in solitude, moving typically from one cemetery to another, taking up residence in haunted houses out in the wilderness and so forth. Now, traditionally, the practice was done in cemeteries or other wild, scary places, the realms of ghosts and spirits and wild beasts and so forth. They would set up a tent at nightfall and sing melodious chant and face every fear, every bit of ego clinging within and make offerings of the body as a feast to the spirits, to the gods and demons which are none other than our own obscurations. And to overcome these and help beings to the power of compassion as a vehicle of healing and a path to enlightenment. So Chud texts and commentaries are actually relatively few. Uh, most of them have been lost forever. But we do have those few. In terms of practices, this is a practice and, and a very advanced practice, so it's not considered appropriate for beginners. You know, dealing with powerful psychological delusions, and so guidance of a master is crucial, and the practice can even be considered to be dangerous. It can bring up things that you're just not prepared to deal with without someone to help guide you through those experiences. So this is not play acting, uh, but a very real out-of-body experience dealing directly with the spirit world of our mind. Otherwise, it becomes just a mild form of self-help. And <clears throat> so this requires an empowerment from a qualified master and involves reciting the texts and the mantras. Uh, typically, there is a beating of a drum, a relatively slow beating. There's a special drum, a chud drum, a rather, rather large format drum used for this. And then it's turned. And the text is chanted in the, according to the beat of the drum as a part of that. In addition, there is a thigh bone trumpet said to come from the thigh of a 16-year-old girl, ideally. Of course, we don't do that today. This one is not even a real bone. Uh, but the trumpet is used to summon the demons and so forth. It can be a little difficult to play, but I'll give it my best here.
So typically that would be done three times at each particular point in the practice where you're summoning these uh, particular uh, forms. And so the specifics of the practice vary somewhat. In the visualization, uh, we are depicted as a dakini and we are naked, white, with three eyes, six bone ornaments, a drum in the right hand, a bell in the left hand, uh, with the right leg uh, lifted up and the left leg bent in what is called the dancing pose. Uh, you may be able to see uh, Machik Labdrin here in the statue uh, in the pose. <clears throat> the six bone ornaments represent the crown, earrings, necklace, and uh, several necklaces in some cases, bracelets and armlets, uh, rather anklets, a skirt, and also cremation ash smeared on the body. Uh, there are four fundamentals of Chud. These are abiding in emptiness, not excluding any being, following the instructions exactly, and being endowed with the influence of the Buddhas. So we keep those in mind as we do the practice. In terms of a general format, we begin with preliminaries, generate bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, our altruistic intention, and then gather the guests. We sound the trumpet, and that then gathers the guests to the feast. We take refuge, we accumulate merit, clear away obscurations through various um, uh, prayers that are uh, get done, and then make offerings. And then the actual practice involves Mahamudra, the nature of mind, emptiness, and then a union of consciousness and space. There are, and this is called POA, uh, transfer of consciousness. There are three approaches approaches that are done to this. The first one is to eject the consciousness as a bindu into the heart of Prajnaparamita, who is above us, at the crown, and then it comes back and we change into Vajravarahi or the wrathful black lady. Uh, the, considered the most wrathful form of Vajrayogini is Troma Nagmo, uh, the wrathful black lady, and is associated with should practice. The second approach is to melt the consciousness and empty space with a pit and then rest in the non-conceptual absorption leaving the body as a corpse and the mind as sky. The third one is to simply remain in clarity and awareness. So these are three different approaches used in, in different texts. The body mandala is then visualized and there in this case is no protection circle unlike many other deity practices and nor do we send away the demons. We in, rather invite them in and make offerings to them in the form of our most precious possession, our body. Uh, there are two main feasts and several others as well in different more elaborate texts, but the white feast and the red feast. In the white feast, we make the body offering transformed into nectar, our bodies transformed into nectar, and offered to the lamas, to the deities, to the dikinis and protectors, as well as all beings. And then the red feast, the body is piled up in heaps of flesh and blood, fat, bones and so forth of the same essence as nectar which is offered to gods and demons, our own mental afflictions if you will. And then there are these other feasts that I mentioned as well in some cases. We may sing and chant loudly or dance as a part of the practice and we cut through all fears and attachments that we may have and afflictive emotions, mental obscurations of mind and so forth. There are four demons of Chud. The first demon are kind of demons, classifications of demons, are the uh, tangible demons. These are the perceptions of our five senses, so seeing, hearing, and so forth. 
And then the intangible demons are considered to be our positive and negative thoughts, feelings, and so forth. The negative emotions, demonic forces, especially anger and hatred. The positive emotions represented by the gods, especially pride and arrogance. The third one are the demons of exaltation, the meditative bliss itself can be a demon. And then the demon of pride or arrogance, the attachment to self and ego. So whatever appears, we let the emotions arise and then remain unmoved by them. We disregard the places, the habits, and so forth, social conventions, until nothing remains but final accomplishment, liberation in Mahamudra. Some practices in also incorporate practice of Chinrezi, uh, Amitayu, and Sukhavati as a part of those. And then we have the conclusion of the dedication. There are different forms of Ched practice. The outer form, we wander in fearful places and encounter the spirit world. The inner form, we offer our own body as food for gods and demons. In the ultimate form, we realize the true nature of mind and cut through even the most subtle forms of ignorance. In the monastic practices, we typically would do a group recitation and then move into our rooms to practice individually. So in conclusion, point out that this became uh, equal to the greatest, or Machikladra became equal to the greatest masters of her time in Tibetan Buddhism. And also this practice personifies the feminine ideal of ultimate realization of primordial wisdom. So Machik Ladrin and her Chud practice are a very important part of the tradition and particularly the divine feminine as it is represented in Tibetan Buddhism. And certainly she is one of the key figures of women in Tibetan Buddhism. So thank you for watching. Our next talk will be on Simha Mukha the lion-faced Dakini. And she has a special role in Tibetan Buddhism as a teacher, and in some cases a protector of the advanced practices. She is an emanation of Vajrayogini and was one of the key teachers of Pabasambhava, who is considered to be the second Buddha by Tibetans. And uh, also he was credited by, with taking a uh, lot of the Tibet, of the Buddhist tradition into Tibet. So until then, abide softly and deeply in pure non-conceptual awareness with, without attachment or aversion and with loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings, always and always. Tashi Dele.